Hello. Welcome. Thanks for coming. We're just getting ourselves situated here. There's Besna. We still can't hear you though. Yep, the unmute. There you go. Yay! All this technical stuff still. How long have we been zooming and it still hangs me up? Yeah. So it looks like we have about 50 people just over. Thank you for everyone that's coming. We really appreciate it. This is Vesna Kittleson. I'm Susanna Schuweiler. Uh, we have some housekeeping to get going. I want to begin by acknowledging that the Wiseman Art Museum is located on the traditional and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. We aspire to honor and respect the indigenous peoples past, present, and future by incorporating indigenous knowledge into our work uh, and establishing meaningful reciprocal relationships with the carriers of indigenous knowledge and with communities. I'm Susanna Schuweiler, the Wiseman's Director of Communications and Marketing, and tonight I'm wearing a different hat. For many years, and even still now sometimes, I'm an arts journalist and editor, and that's the hat I'm wearing tonight. I was lucky enough to write an essay for Vesna Kittleson's new catalog, Synthesis, Lost and Found in America, The Art of Vesna Kittleson. Um, this book is a pretty big deal and it was published uh, with help and assistance from Minnesota State Arts Board, Weissman Art Museum, Afton Press, Smart Set Design and University of Minnesota Press. It always feels right and good to acknowledge the people that make work like this happen. It's always such a collaborative process. Um, tonight, we have the pleasure of talking with Vesna Kittleson about her varied career and current practice, as well as her Young Americans installation, which is in situ at the Weissman through January 3rd. The museum spaces are temporarily closed, but we're hopeful that they'll open again sometime soon. And it's been wonderful having those portraits on site. Copies of the new book signed by the artist are also on sale at the Wham Shop. And if you can't make it in person, we've got curbside pickup, shipping, you can order it online or call by phone and you can get it without coming into the store if you're more comfortable doing that. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the voters of Minnesota for supporting the operational budget of our museum through funds from the Minnesota State Arts Board. Thanks also to Wells Fargo Foundation Minnesota for supporting our operations at the museum. Finally, I'm really grateful to our colleagues at the Weissman who are all working behind the scenes to make programs like this possible. So thank you. Um, as we begin our conversation, here's the housekeeping, the Zoom stuff. Uh, we invite you to submit your questions and thoughts via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll respond to those in the Q&A period after Vesna and I have a conversation. You can upvote the questions that you find interesting or comment on them and they'll rise to the top of my feed. Um, we'll be recording tonight's event and it'll be posted to the Wiseman's YouTube channel so people who can't make it tonight will be able to watch later. Finally, we have a live transcription available. You'll see it at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's called live transcript, but you have to enable it. It's not automatic. So you'll need to turn it on. Uh, you click over it. You'll see a menu that says show subtitles in the drop down menu. Um, and you just click that and it'll do a live transcription as we speak. Now, fun stuff. I'm pleased to introduce Vesna Kittleson to you. She was born in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She's of Croatian descent. She later became a naturalized American. She's lived between split Croatia, Cambridge, England, and Minneapolis all these years. She was an original member of the feminist WARM Gallery. WARM stands for the Women's Art Registry of Minnesota. She taught studio art classes at MCAD for years. Uh, Vesna was also a founding member of the Traffic Zone Center for Visual Art, where she still maintains a studio. She was also a member of the co-op form and content gallery in Minneapolis from 2013 to 2019. She's an artist who likes co-op galleries. Yes. Vesna's exhibited her work widely. Her artwork is included in collections all over the world, including the Brooklyn Museum Art Library, the Bush Foundation Collection, Kafeshtian Center for the Arts, Dibner Library and the Smithsonian Libraries, Getty Research Institute, Minnesota Center for Book Arts, Minnesota History Center, Minnesota Museum of American Art, the Tate Library and Tate Britain, 
Walker Arts Center Library. Our own Wiseman Art Museum is lucky enough to have artworks by Vesna. Victoria and Albert, the National Art Library and the Yale University Art Library to name just some. So welcome Vesna. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone being here. Thank you, Susanna, for this uh, interview that you're doing. And also Sam and Katie who are behind the scenes doing the technical aspect of things, which is to me uh, completely you know, unknown. And I appreciate everybody's uh, efforts to uh, be here this evening. And I appreciate all of you, including the people and the institutions that you mentioned, Susanna, who were participants in making the book come together. I would like to just mention that there were eight authors and six essays, uh, topics, six topics and eight authors um, for this book. And I'd also like to mention that the people who are private donors have helped me very much by raising funds that could uh, then be used for, for such a fabulous production of this book. Yeah. And so now I am uh, definitely going to leave it to you to begin with questions for me. <laughs> sure thing. First of all, when we called this a virtual studio visit, we weren't kill we weren't kidding. It's it's in yeah. your studio. You yeah. have one of the coolest studios I've ever been lucky enough to be in. <laughs> Thank you. I I enjoy it. Of course, uh, we artists uh, who produce large work are quite greedy and want the whole building. You know, not one little studio that is thirteen hundred square feet. You know, but yes, I do love my studio. Thank you very much. I love seeing all of your artwork back behind you, yeah. which reminds me, it's sort of, I'm, I'm looking at the busts that you have back there, your heads. Mm -hmm. And my first question for you is really about the visual culture where you were growing up because Croatia is, you know, one of the longest continuously occupied city split is. And so can yeah. you just tell us a little bit, what was it like visually where you grew up and, and history is such a rich theme in your work and the sense of myth and, and legendary time? You know, um, uh, I grew up in a home with parents who were not very pro-communist, who really um, uh, liked beauty. And I, I think that one of the problems with communism is that it is anti-beauty. And so we were always admiring littlest things from geraniums to handmade cakes to fabulous architecture that split has wall to wall of the historical you know, profile of architecture from early um, years like the fourth century, which was actually a very developed architecture of Roman empire that is a central part of city called split like in banana split in, in case you didn't hear of it. Um, uh, so Split was actually a city that evolved around and in the center of that initial palace that Tsar Diocletian, uh, the Emperor Diocletian built for himself. And uh, uh, I was subjected uh, to uh, presence of very developed architectural form in Rome. But then of course came Middle Ages and then Renaissance, we have Middle Ages architecture, Renaissance architecture, Baroque architecture, all the way to the communist time when it was really very anti-aesthetic uh, type of architecture. So as a child, I was surrounded by all of this and being an observer, of course it mattered to me. I had no idea what these elements were. What are these pillars? What is the difference between Corinthian pillar and Ionic pillar? I had no idea that takes education, but I was definitely going around them, seeing them, noticing them, keeping it all as information that was visual for me. It was incredibly important. In that time, that was very restrictive of aesthetics, you know. Right. So for me, it was like a, 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 an extension into, into unknown, but very important, very powerful, very impacting. Right. And uh, when we've talked before, you've talked about walking around and seeing all of these 
fragments yeah. of history. Yeah. Yeah. And I always thought it was really interesting, the idea of the bust being yeah. really familiar to you, this yes. fragment of a person. Yes, because they, they were carvings and they're still, if you come to Split, you'll see them just on the, on, on the streets, you know. Uh, you can just, you know, see the carvings, you can see, you know, half or a third or a whole pillar as, in fact, people sit on them. And when I was a kid, we would lick ice cream sitting on these pillars, never knowing that this is supposed to be very precious and very uh, important history. It was passed down to us to uh, respect, you know. But uh, there is so much of it, you know, that it is very helpful, of course, you know, no place can surpass Italy, you know. So I always say Croatia is sort of like poor Italy, you know, it's poor. Everything is not that kind of scale and not that kind of grandeur, but it is nevertheless all there. And, and I, as a, as a visual person, I, as an artist, born to be an artist, I was very aware of its power its, its impact, but not necessarily formal knowledge. I had none of that. That came much later in my life. But um, this kind of uh, aesthetics that were uh, rolling from time to time to time to time was very much the way I think my mind shaped. You know, I am able to go to different historical periods because my imagination, which I called cosmic sandals, you know, takes me through these different uh, periods and, and, and they all are displaying something very different from a previous period, right. you know, well, like, it's like gothic architecture different from, uh, you know, previous architectures. It's completely different aesthetics and it's wonderful to see. Right. Well, and they're all there side by side. And yeah. one of the things that's really striking to me, if you're a little girl sitting on a pillar, eating an ice cream cone, surrounded by this palimpsest of history and style yeah. and aesthetics, then you get to take ownership of it in a way that those of us who live in a much younger country don't. Yeah. Like you get to, in some way, be a citizen of all those historical periods. There are advantages to, to much younger country too, you know, but uh, the advantage is to very old uh, area that, that has been, you know, uh, Croatia was, you know, Venetian, it was uh, Italian, it was uh, uh, Austrian. It, so everybody deposited their very marks, which, you know, I think architecture is one of the stronger ones, you know. And uh, so you end up being a child that inherits all this. And, you know, uh, I always think that because I was a child with a pencil and the paper, communism or capitalism, nothing entered me. You know, nothing comes between the pencil and the paper, just your mind, just your own imagination, you know. So that is what I was doing. I was taking what I wanted and I wasn't taking what I didn't want. You know, with some assistance of my parents who were very disgruntled with the time that they lived in. Right. Well, and thinking too about the way you described yourself a minute ago as an observer from the time even you were a little girl and how much that thread carries through, aside from the obvious connection with being an immigrant here, but could you talk a little bit about the in-betweenness of yeah. that, of both being a participant in the culture around you, but also yeah. an observer of it. So here, I think participation is very important because this is exactly what you and I are doing right now. We are doing something that's cultural, you know, and I really feel that I am such a committed community person. If, wherever I live, even when I'm in Cambridge temporarily or in Split temporarily, I'm 100% you know, involved in that kind of culture. I really like that, it suits me very much. But observation is, a, I think, a, you know, practiced privilege. I learned how to look at things. I learned how to edit things. And I put that together, you know, the, the, uh, the observation and then, you know, circumstance that I'm in um, as a community and very much a community person as well, you know, and participant. And I think that my 
art is very participatory type of art, you know. It is always inviting people. I can tell you that, you know, some people don't like my art, some people like my art very much, but nevertheless, it's never neutral. You know, people do respond to it. That means that, you know, I'm participating. And I am doing that, which I'm supposed to do. Particularly, I can say that my interest is not to do commercial art. So people are very engaged and they end up discussing things with me. And I think that that is participation, you know? Right. That's my job. Right. Well, can you walk us through, as we're thinking about the participation in the, in the cultural dialogue, because you've talked about it in that sense too, that this is something that, I love that you're claiming your spot in that art historical conversation, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you've entered right in the fray and that you've, you've taken your space there. Yeah. Um, could, you, could you talk a little bit more about how you made that transition from split and your growing up years to what what brought you here and you know, how did you go from being a, a lawyer yes. to being someone teaching studio art here in the you know my parents were like i mentioned before sort of anxious about their time and so when uh, i was a student you know it was a uh, really better for them and for me to uh, study law because there would be uh, actually a job you know, there are no grants, even now, the grants are rare. And so, you know, you're really kind of uh, moved in a direction of a practic practical way of thinking about what you're going to do. So I finished my law degree, but as I was doing it, I always thought that what I would do since I'm not an artist, I was not an artist at that point, that I would be art collector. I, I have to tell you, art has been always with me. So what way would it I, uh, what what way would it be with me, you know? And I thought when I become a lawyer and I was going to do international law, meaning I would travel, because Split is also a very important port, uh, seaport, and it is um, a very important uh, shipbuilding yard, and I was going to work with them and for them. So I thought, you know, okay, I will be a collector of art. That is what I want to do. But then as I went to Cambridge to study English so I could do some of that law degree, I began doing some uh, art history studies. I borrowed millions of books, looked at them. I mean, it was absolutely a visual feast for very many months. And I, um, started doing art totally unprofessionally, just, you know, awkwardly. And um, I never stopped, you know, I mean, that, th at that moment, I actually, two hours after I arrived to Cambridge, England, I met my husband, David, who told me what he wanted to do in his life. And I thought that sounded absolutely fabulous. And he said, you should be an artist if that's what you want, you know. And it just seemed all of a sudden real, you know. And then when we came to Minneapolis, which is where he is from, um, I think we arrived on Wednesday and on Monday, I already went to my first art class. You know, I registered on Thursday probably. You know, I went to my first class and I, and I walked into the studio arts building a little bit early, like lunch hour, just before my class at one starts. And I heard uh, um, lots of noises. People were lunching. Uh, there were models. There were students. There were faculty. There were a couple of dogs there, and the huge boombox uh, playing. I can get no satisfaction. That moment, I knew I'm staying here. This is where I belong. This is the best there is. It matches my spirit, my mind. My soul, I am not leaving. And at that moment, I know I became an artist. Left the legal uh, degree behind. And, and ever since then, I've been doing this. This feels like a really natural point to talk about the Young American series. Uh -huh. This explains so much yeah. about the affinity that you feel yeah. with these uh, subjects of your portraits. Could you could you tell us a little bit about who are these young Americans? How uh -huh. did you come to meet them? Yeah. 
So there are some things that are specifically about us immigrants uh, that, that immigrants deal with. One of which is, you know, this kind of uh, uh, understanding democracy, especially those of us who came from not democracy. So I, I am continuously to this day thinking about what is most democratic about the United States? What is it in daily life that is very democratic? What would I say it is? Especially my family, but my friends also would say, so what is democratic about? What tell us about this, you know? It's very difficult to talk about democracy, and, but I was always left with this feeling, I must think what is the most democratic so I can tell them. You know, and I'm thinking about it. And one day as I was teaching the class in Minneapolis College of Art and Design, I came a little early and I walked into the classroom and I saw three students pouring over the uh, art materials that they just purchased. And I greeted them and they lifted their faces with smiles and I saw three different races. And I thought to myself, you know what? This is our democracy in daily life. This is what is very much, you know, not the constitution. I'm not talking about documents. That's super important, but it's somebody else's quest. You know, my quest was about daily life. And here were my students showing me how they know how to live together, regardless of their backgrounds, meaning the financial background, meaning their gender issues, meaning their love, meaning the race, it doesn't matter. They know how to live together. And I thought this is the most beautiful aspect of democracy that I can think of. Today, I think of something else. I'm thinking of to, uh, this recent election, which is a historic, you know, but at that time, this displayed itself as the most powerful reminder of what I think I could say is democratic about us. We are all one. These people were representing the community. And so I started asking first several of my students that were my students, if they would be interested in me doing this project that would be doing Young Americans because I wanted uh, to enjoy very much their brilliance. I think young people in America are very smart. I think they're very, able to live together. I think that they're great for the future for our country. And I wanted to honor that. So I began with one, which was of Areca. I think that is in the exhibition that, that show, uh, that uh, portrait. I made two portraits of Areca. Areca happened to be uh, a, a black American who um, was in my class and probably maybe three years older than the rest of the students. And she was here waiting for her, um, uh, uh, her partner to be done with his project. They're both from California at this point they were. And uh, I asked her first if she would be my model. That's how it started. Hmm. And then, uh, you know, many different people joined in. I'm curious, before we leave the Young Americans, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about your process and your practice, right. because that's one of the most interesting things. In the gallery, you'll see these are, are cut out paintings that are hung directly on the wall, not framed. So the, the mode of making them is really distinctive. Could you walk mm -hmm. us through how you would go about making one of these yeah. portraits? Yes, from the, I think, early times when I was still in Warm, I became quite interested in working on paper and I became quite interested in uh, uh, cutting the paper paintings and then hanging them directly on the wall. So this was a natural progression for me to do with portraits. I thought that portraits at that time were told to have be in a huge crisis. Why make portraits? We have photography and so, so on. I decided that I would make an unconventional kind of portrait. Why would I do a conventional portrait? It wasn't really natural to me. So I started buying sheets of paper that I would work on 
looking very little bit at the photograph that I took of my subject, any one of the young Americans, I would work on developing something that would um, resemble my satisfaction with showing them as very much thinking people, their intelligence, their, their, their self-confidence was very good. And I thought that this was really, <laughs> results were very optimistic. But at the very end, when I'm finished with the painting of the uh, portrait, which in this case, I was doing with oils and paper. Then I would take a scissor, I would cut the portrait out and, and abandon all that I didn't think was necessarily part of that painting. Mm -hmm. This gave me a possibility to put the painting directly on the wall and also to cut the distance between the viewer and the image. I think that that is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I like that. Although I also did paintings uh, that are on canvas, but really something that I significantly felt a pull towards was cutouts, which started in warm gallery, then in cell portraits, even in war paintings, and then uh, uh, young Americans. Uh, I really feel that um, paper is very difficult material to store and it likes to tear and so on. So what I thought, I have to figure out how to make it all stable. And I decided that I would put silk in the back. Most of my portraits have silk in the back because that keeps the shape and it also protects them from tearing and being damaged. So that is the technical aspect. Mm -hmm. I, I love this. Uh... I love what you're saying about work on paper because I do see that throughout your work yeah. and it, this affinity with text, with paper, yeah. with cutting down the distance between the viewer and the work. And that kind of feels like a natural segue to the altered dictionaries too, mm -hmm. because you've got this cutting, this paper, there's mm -hmm. something about the cutting. Could mm -hmm. you show us one of the altered dictionaries and, and let's yeah. talk a little bit yeah. about what it is to cut those up and where do they come from? Yes. So I'll tell you a little bit about also um, what is, uh, I think, uh, do you see it? Mm -hmm. okay. I do. We can see them behind you too. Yes, I'll tell you a little bit about that too. I just want to show you some. Uh, I thought we were talking about showing some uh, that, that are actually sure. like this. Yeah. So, um, Again, at, at, at one point, it was in 1914, I was asking myself, what defines me most as an immigrant? What would that be? And I remember that I came to America from a very poor background with only one suitcase. And I had two dictionaries in this uh, suitcase. One was Croatian American and the other one was American Croatian, you know, English Croatian. And so it would be dictionary. So I started collecting dictionaries that are on the way to a dumpster to, to, to be disposed of, because we know now that they are remnants of another time. And I was only interested in those that were secondhand dictionaries because I wanted to environmentally, you know, um, uh, 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 make alteration and, and reuse, uh, re repurpose it. So what I did is I collected lot, lots of dictionaries and I started looking through them. So at this point, you know, this shows a little bit about how I come up with the question that I call a studio question. I was starting to abandon the idea of me being a, an immigrant and needing a dictionary completely in, or, uh, in favor of me going through different languages, diction, di different dictionaries and seeing that each one of these dictionaries represented a human group. It actually represented someone and in fact quite accurately and quite deeply. These languages, are, uh, these uh, dictionaries are really deep thing. The language is a very deep thing about us, the words and sentences. 
And so I started thinking, okay, so what I want in my life is to make peace in the world, but I cannot make peace in the world. It will never happen. So what I should do is make peace in my studio using all of these different dictionaries that represent different groups that are even sometimes quarrel. And we know that the language is very often used as a weapon. We know that right now our nation is very quarreled. We know that our president is viewed as a man who is very great provocateur with words. We know that we have fallen into some wars and maybe even another war, who knows what. So language is always a victim of misused application and uh, and very often, I mean, you think of language, you want it to be poetry, you want it to be great communication, but it's not always that. It is often misused. So in order to avoid that, to stop that, make peace in my studio, I decided to alter the, uh, page, the cover page of each one of these dictionaries that were on the way to a dumpster. And so that you cannot tell what language they represent. So I then designed the library stacks. I put them in the library stacks where I, I call it a peace library where they can all coexist in peace and no one language dominates. Nobody dominates. I think that is a way of you know, altering even ourselves. Maybe we need to change a little bit so the person next to us does not feel like we are not accessible or that we are scary or something. I am all for peace. And if I can't make it in the world, I certainly can in my studio. That's interesting. So the dictionaries are in some ways, they alter, you alter them. They need to adapt to one another maybe in ways that the cultures from which they originate are having trouble. Yes, adapting. there are some. Uh, languages here and representing countries that don't talk with each other or are even, you know, uh, disputing borders or, you know, difficult things, mm -hmm. you know, and not in my studio. They can't. They have yeah. to behave. <laughs> <laughs> it's an order. <laughs> it's an order. I this... alter them. I'm not asking them. <laughs> <laughs> While we're thinking about paper and artist books, could we talk a little bit about the Darwin's Garden oh, artist yes. books that you've yes. done? I'd really love to see those. And okay. how did this project come about? How did you, this is kind of a departure. You've done a number of little artist books like this, haven't you? I, actually, I've done nine books now and I'm about to make two more and that will take some time, but I mean, that's what I'm working on. And so uh, what happened with the Mrs. Darwin's Garden is that in 2009, I decided to go with David to Cambridge, England, where he had uh, done his degree and had projects to do. And I was also given a studio there to come and use. I thought that what I would do is I would take young Americans over there and brag about brilliance of our young people, show these portraits there. So that's what I brought along. But as we arrived to Cambridge in 2009, this was the 2009, we realized that it was a year of Darwin. Why? Because he was educated in Cambridge and 2009 was 200th year of his birth, but it was also 150th year of his uh, theory of evolution that he wrote, mm -hmm. The Origins of Species. Mm -hmm. And so um, as I was living there, I got a lot of information about Darwin and I learned some unexpected things about him. One is that he and Emma shared a huge love. He was married to Emma Darwin and they had this huge love that I was very impressed by. He wrote to her just before uh, their wedding in which he said, I think you will humanize me. 
and soon teach me there is greater happiness than building theories and accumulating facts in silence and solitude. When I read this from a great botanist, from a great bi bi biologist, I decided this is a very impressive. This is a great love, you know. So I started looking at their love to find out that in fact they had incredibly big problems once they got married because uh, Emma was very religious and a Victorian style religious. She believed that if you don't honor God only, that means that you will, you know, that she could, they could cause a, a revenge of, of God, God's revenge upon the empire, uh, England and the household. That was her view. She really believed that. She was scared physically and, and mentally of, of that. While Darwin, of course, couldn't really give all the credit to God because he was explaining us by nature. Yeah. So uh, to not upset Emma, he didn't write his theory of evolution for 20 years, mm -hmm. you know. And then the time came when he had to do it in order to have it recognized as his work. So when I came to England learning all this about, I thought, you know, it'd be so nice if I could enter this world of Darwin's, but how can you? They are icons and, and also, I mean, they are so well known. You can't really be superficial about it. So what I thought I would do is take the artistic license with the question that I asked, which was, what was Darwin thinking that he would, night before, that what was he thinking a night before the Beagle came to the unexplored show, uh, shores? What was he thinking he would find there as Flora? And I said, if he would find these kinds of plants, I'm pretending I'm his illustrator. I take my cosmic sandals and imagine that I can see into his mind's eye and that the art that I'm making is the art that I see in his mind that he would find in terms of flora. You know, in his mind, a night before the beagle, the ship arrived to the unexplored shores. So that gave me sort of a non judgmental approach to Darwin because there are many people who don't agree with, with uh, his uh, findings and there are people who very much support him. So I don't belong to either camp. Instead, I'm making art that I say is about uh, what he was imagining the night before the Beagle came to the shores of unexplored land as for. So this is uh, the book. Maybe is this better? It is. Well, what what's striking to me about this is that you're using what you're calling your cosmic sandals. This is another exercise in empathy. Like this is your door in. It's Darwin's theories are kind of window dressing, if I'm understanding you right. Like they're important, but they're not the main thing. The main thing for you in this is about the exercise in empathy. Like what is it like to be in his head for a little while? Yes. Of course, I mean, his theories are so incredibly important and I don't understand them, know them or feel expertly involved in it. So what I do is I address uh, Darwin in a, in a way that is uh, completely impossible. It is an imagination of an artist taking an artistic license and, and going that way. So I made four of these books and the original ones are in, you can see four lines. This is the fourth one. And uh, I, uh, I uh, uh, got a message from the uh, Tate Britain. Tate Britain uh, holds the library for all other Tates, Tate Modern, Tate Liverpool and so on. And so they said they would like to uh, uh, on that, um, those four books, and that's where they went. This made a huge difference to me. 
it seems like it was a turning point in my career after the Tate took my work in. And not only that, the uh, senior librarian met with me for three years because I wasn't finished immediately with all four books. So she met, met with me for three years. We would have cakes and tea and coffee and chatted and was absolutely wonderful. And, uh, um, when was this? When did the Tate take these books? 15, 16, 17. Okay. Yeah. That was a big project then. It is. It was for me. And especially, I never thought that I would do this project. You know, initially, I was just interested in what was happening in Cambridge. And Cambridge was very involved with uh, having, you know, a, a celebration of Darwin. There was absolutely ravishing, incredible, fabulous exhibition of all of his documentation, of all of the drawings that were done uh, with his real illustrator and other illustrators later, you know, uh, of the findings that they had and so on. And so of course, uh, uh, mine was just a matter of imagination and sort of playful approach mm -hmm. to uh, that kind of uh, beauty of discovering the new world and unexplored lands you know that must be something very special i thought you know. what's also striking about that series of books that i see again and again especially in your painted work is this explosion of color you are yeah. not shy about color yeah. you're a colorist by training yeah. Yeah. yeah yes i am and also when i finished my training i decided you know i don't know anything about how to be an artist or how to be a painter so what should i do I decided that I would take uh, color as my first element of design, a first factor in painting and study it. And forget about theories, uh, uh, you know, whatever was found in 19th century, uh, you know, as, as a truth or a reality and just work on my own color. Uh, I, I started first with the minimalist work where I was exploring the complementary colors. Then I added second element of design, which would be brushwork, mm -hmm. you know, and then a third element of design, which would be scissors that would cut out everything that was not uh, pertinent to the work, right. you know, to stay with the paper. That's one of the things, actually, I have to say, let's, okay, I'm going to plug the book for a second. That's one of the things that's nicest about the book is that there's this sense of chronology and evolution in here. So you've got those minimalist line paintings represented in here, and you can really see the way the nuances and color and composition change over the years as your mm -hmm. mode of work and, and as your medium shifts. Yes, and I was adding other elements later on, faces, and then later on deciding that I like um, abstraction equally as I like the figurative. I mean, these are all, you know, things that were sort of layered uh, interests of mine. And, My uh, eye keeps going to the painting behind you. Yes. You tell, what is that? What are we looking at there? We, we're is, looking that recent? is that older? We are looking here. You see, this is a sculpture that is part of this painting. Okay. This, this painting uh, uh, was uh, uh, based on, on uh, me feeling that there are many other cultures, which I didn't know in Europe, you know. I didn't know initially that there are many other viable cultures like African culture, like native culture, like Buddhist culture and so on. And I'm wondering uh, what then do I think as an artist that I could um, work with that would be inclusive and, and not offensive to, to um, uh, these uh, new cultures to me. And I was thinking, you know, that it would be good to use uh, uh, African uh, images that I would like very much to keep for, for uh, you know, like protectively to, to, to continue working with art that is, you know, Roman, then Greek, 
than I have here in my own head, which is now, you know, um, from my uh, house collection of uh, artifacts from different cultures. So this is a Mayan head, then Indian head from India. Mm -hmm. Then this is a African mask. And in the back is a, a replica of Michelangelo's uh, uh, slaves. So, so I am having uh, together a painting and then sources of painting that these sculptures they're all replicas in this case, are, you know, and uh, uh, I live with this and many more things. I have many African masks. I also have a, a Roman pottery. Mm -hmm. Th these would be original things, you know, in, in my house. And I always, always, always loved looking at it, thinking about it, being entered by them having them having an impact on me and so on. So I made this painting and this sculpture to be together uh, eventually um, because uh, they represent the sources for me. And so the, the legs climbing the, uh, this would be 19th century, um, you know, pillars that you can find all around Paris, but they also exist in my studio, if you can believe that. These <laughs> very same things, you know, this is, mm -hmm. this building is like 130 years old. So still, I was thinking of something strong that would hold these cultural elements for me together. So I have rope and I have steel and it is sort of a anxiety of uh, how to find what else is there you know, and, and making a painting. So um, I, I, like, I like this painting very much because um, it, it kind of shows uh, my uh, uh, affection for that which in my life flow, wherever I was in my age and in my history, I've been impacted by these cultures that are no more, they're gone, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, I love seeing artifacts from those times. Mm -hmm. and they the matter to me. They matter to me. They actually show me, emotionally speaking, that you know I'm just uh, at this moment in in history with all of you, my my guests uh, tonight, and you. We are in this uh, life flow, given this period of time, to uh, be here, and. Uh, seeing all of these cultures that were there but are not here anymore gives me a feeling that it's okay. You know, this is okay. Yeah. Well, while we're thinking about that and thinking about the ephemeral and mortality and things, I, I have to ask, this has been such a weird year and here we are in your studio. What What is a day of practice like for you now? I know you used to split your time uh, you would go to split. Did you go this year? Did you? Did no, you miss no, we couldn't travel. We were in Paris and split last January, just before pandemic became an obvious thing to us. I think it was at that time in China. And uh, when we came back here, it, it intensified and became much worse. And uh, of course, this summer, the travel was forbidden. You couldn't even go to Europe. And I know that Europe has struggled on and off with pandemic as well. So we are all waiting to, you know, get this uh, serum to protect us, this vaccine to protect us, and then maybe we can start breathing more relaxed. But it seems to me like pandemic is really intensified and it's really good to stay home. Yeah, agreed. You know? Yeah. It's but in terms of my practice, you know, I am by myself in my studio and whoever visits me in the studio is very much by appointment. I mean, I have friends and colleagues that come and visit. We, we you know, uh, talk about art, we have lunch, whatever. But um, uh, that, that, therefore, that pandemic did not impact me very much. I come to the studio, I'm by myself. I'm not dangerous to anyone else. 
And uh, so far it's been remarkable. Nobody in the building had uh, COVID. That's good. So that's good. And so my practice continues to be very much the same. You know, that did not, I think artists really are lucky in that sense. We, we, we are so um, much by ourselves in our own minds, you know, and our own practices that, that, that I don't think changes it enormously. You know, it is more, I feel culturally a huge pressure. I do really feel that, you know. Uh, it has been quite an eventful year, I think, uh, you know, with the election and uh, with the pandemic, it's been quite a demanding time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm seeing some questions popping up in the Q&A and I want to make sure that okay. we get to them. Yeah. We haven't had a chance. I, I have my little list of questions and we're still missing some. Um, what is your, before we move on to Q&A, could you just talk a little bit about your connection to the University of Minnesota and the Weissman yeah. and- So and when I came to uh, Minneapolis after uh, Mary David arrived here, I immediately enrolled into Studio Arts where I finished a degree, it was a BA degree and then master's degree in design. I worked with Jean Larkin particularly. And after that, I started practicing art in the in the studio which uh, was a completely new thing for me you know I was um, uh, doing that and I also became a member of warm uh, gallery that was incredibly relevant time for me I can't emphasize it enough this was a really important uh, a time for me because I was learning how to be a professional artist I was learning about how to be a woman artist in the male world. I mean, it's got to, you have to believe me, it was really sort of peak of that at that time in 1970s. It was all male uh, community. And uh, um, I, I like many male artists. I don't have any problem with that, but I had a problem with the fact that uh, your value as a, a female artist is diminished just by your gender. You know, that was not feeling right. And so uh, the, the warm and the studio were very important to me to start producing work, exhibiting work, thinking about what it is that I'm doing. I'm often asking myself after I do a body of work, what is it that this work is telling me? What am I seeing? in this work. So these were all new things, you know, that were part of one person's development, you know. Mm -hmm. And so University of Minnesota provided me with these degrees that actually cultured me in, you know, we were all obsessed with New York at that time. So I knew about minimalism. I also knew about abstract expressionism, pop art, this and that. I began traveling and so, um, I think the extension of the University of Minnesota was really important in travel. You know, I was kind of culturing myself as an art historian because I took art history classes at the U of M. And then the U of M had also the museum here, you know, the Wiseman Museum. Uh, it became incredibly important because I feel that uh, this museum, the Wiseman Art Museum, has been open to uh, uh, local artists at a time when uh, local was not a very good word. It seemed to be a negative word, like we were in no man's land or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, felt as a woman artist, and then there is this world of uh, negativism toward mid Midwest was an awful lot to observe. So you had to drop all of that think of the University of Minnesota as a great light in, in Minnesota. It is a great source of intelligence, education, possibilities, and uh, Wiseman Art Museum as well. Hmm. Well, speaking of that, because we're talking about the Wiseman and about its dedication to women artists in particular, 
Lyndall King, our former director, has asked a number of really terrific questions, and it only feels right to give Lyndall the first yes, question. Definitely, yes. She's asked, there are a couple that I've got my eye on, but here's one that a couple of people have liked and it's been bumped to the top. Uh, Linda uh -huh. asks, you're talking about Mrs. Darwin and how he wrote to her that she would humanize him. I know you're married to a scientist, she writes. Do you see yourself as Mrs. Darwin? <laughs> I wouldn't dare. Mrs. Darwin was a great pianist, you know. She was actually a protege. She was very brilliant herself. And uh, I don't see myself as Mrs. Darwin, but I do have to honestly say that David's projects, and he's talking about them, has opened that field to me. I am always at the you know outskirts of it. I'm always worried about it. I can't really enter it. I don't understand. I'm not very mathematical and scientific, but I like the ideas in science. For example, the environmental work that's being done. David is a specialist in that, in one category of that. And I have always listened and heard about that. I know that we are ruining the earth for very many years. This is not new to me as it has been now in the last 10 years, really kind of a new news. Not to me, I knew that from, from the beginning. So Mrs. Darwin, I, I don't know about that, but fun question, I appreciate it. it is a fun well, my, my Darwin does help me. Here's another question. This actually came up a couple times in the Q&A. Donna Bruni and Lyndall both ask about the process of cutting. Um, the cutting out of shapes. Lyndall asks, is this related to your growing up in split? Is there any connection between this and the busts and, and the fragments of art? Could you talk a little bit about that process yes. of cutting? I, 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 think, I think that my uh, uh, cutouts, which I think is really great specificity in my, in, in my work uh, for me, uh, are related to several things. One is fragments that are all over Split, and some of you have been to Split, so you would know what I'm talking about. I mean, there are always these reliefs that are, you know, uh, from the 4th century, from the 7th century, 9th century, so on. I, I, I definitely feel that that visually engaged me as a child, as a young person. But also then later on in my life, African masks are very important in my uh, uh, cutout work and also um, uh, native uh, work of native artists, you know, the, um, the very tall sculptures, what are they called? I forget at the moment, um, poles, uh, oh, you yeah. know. With, with the image on the top, which is very expressive. I like the expressiveness of native art very much, you know, and, um, and uh, also of African uh, masks. They, they have unbelievable facial expression. I feel that they're fearless works. And I really feel that <laughs> to be an artist, it's important to be sort of fearless and just do what you do. You know, so yes, these are my sources. First of all, the the stone uh, uh, fragments that you see in Split, but then African masks and also totem poles. Before we move on to the next question, I just want to press a little on that. What uh, what about it is fearless to you, and and what is it about the idea of masking, or it, how are those two things connected to the process? that we see like in your portraits or in the things that are mm -hmm. cut out? Well, I think that uh, fearless to me uh, as an artist, what it means is that you continue doing your work even when you don't feel that people necessarily immediately support you. You know, uh, I, I, what's fearless to me is that I have never been driven by commercial aspect of work. I am very much interested in beauty that grows out of structure. So I think going deep into work, uh, deeply analyzing the studio question, 
with experimenting, not succeeding, throwing things away, coming back to it, continuing, uh, is, is that's fearless, you know, rather than imagining a piece and then, and then making it look like that. You know, I don't do that at all. I basically have a studio question, then I start experimenting, then I start looking for ways that these two parts, uh, the question and the images start coming together. That is when I'm starting to feel, start feeling that I am getting somewhere. So it's, it comes out of the process of making yeah. as much as it yeah. does the initial concept. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does. I, I'm trying to get the two parts, actually more than two parts. I mean, one is an idea that becomes, grows into a question, then experimentation, and in that I'm interested in getting uh, the production to be on the same level as the as the question is. They can't not be together. They've got to be together at the same level of development. Mm -hmm. Do you have a studio question you're working on right now? Uh, I, I I I always do. Yes. Yes. Do you have one or do you have like ten? I, I I have two. One is uh, my, my question is. Uh, you know, how to make a composition that can comes out of layered and layered and layered text and the drawing. So I am doing palimpsest pages, sort of, of the, uh, different works of art. I will again have African art, I'll have a, a native art and I'll have a Western art together. And so I um, uh, do an interpretation of some works of art. I'm not copying them, they're just interpretation. Um, so we have um, Las Meninas here, mm -hmm. uh, which I am doing only with pencils. I'm erasing and rewriting and redrawing and re-erasing, erasing again and so on until I start developing composition that uh, to me is visually strong. So I am going to name this project actually has a name, which is, uh, uh, which, which is uh, uh, a medieval saying that, that uh, um, I think priests said uh, when they were copying Bibles, three fingers work, the, uh, three fingers write, the whole body works. Because it does, your mind, your eyes, your, your gestures, you know, everything is in it. I, I like that expression. Uh, three fingers, right? The whole body works. So well, given, I'm working on many pieces. Right. Well, given what you were just talking about, this process of making being itself part of that creative practice. Yeah. There's an interesting ritual element to the work of palimpsest creation, I would Yes, say. because they're only pencils, you know, I'm not using anything else, just pencils. I have gridded, a grid paper, so it looks like it's a notebook of sorts. And then I write sentences about this art that we already know that is in the texts everywhere that I have seen mostly and then uh, the drawing as well, and then erasing it and taking that, those fragments and developing layers of, of uh, so palimpsest, I should maybe say, developed uh, 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 in early ages of, of uh, book existence when uh, paper was parchment paper. And when the book, which was very rare object was, uh, 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 given to another owner, then that owner would often erase the text that was there and write their own text. But of course, there would be layers of leftovers, letter, leftover letters uh, in there. And there is absolutely stunning kind of composition that can happen from that. So I am doing something like that, hmm. you know. I love that. I can't wait to see that finished. Yeah, okay. that, I'm thinking like, you know, quite a few pieces. So it's going to be longer term book. It will be a book that will be in a box. Mm. Okay. 
Okay. Here's a question from David Feinberg. He says, Vesna, you suggested that an individual artist can't make peace in the world, but you create an atmosphere of peace in your art and in your studio. Is this teaching by example that you recommend artists take on? Is following a fashion, uh, or is following fashion a counter direction to peace? Well, following a fashion is not necessarily, you know, uh, opposite. I'm just, you know, um, thinking that, you know, I always try to think of, of myself as a, um, a belonging to that time where it, that is different from, let's say, Picasso's time. He was the artist of early 20th century. We don't have that anymore. We are all sort of together depositing our ideas, depositing our art, and I think the future generations will uh, just learn from us all uh, together, you know, uh, how, we, how we thought, how we function, how we perceived what art is and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, rather than, let's say, one name, I can't think of who would that be today, you know. It is many of us. So I think of myself small. I think of myself as a small, unimportant person that was given this period in life to do something. And that something is art with all other artists. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually is a really nice point to go to Rebecca Pavlenko's question, which has to do with that being an artist in community. She uh, asks, how does being in an artist community affect your ideas and your art from warm to the teaching community at MCAD to your current studio at Traffic Zone? Oh, I think entirely my, uh, of myself as a community person. I just do my little thing in my studio, whatever that is, you know? And that is always a part of some community. You have named them yourself. So I was part of all of these communities. And that means with other colleagues, with other artists, with other friends. Yes, the exchange of ideas, the exchange of, of uh, uh, you know, actually even works. Do you know that I have a collection of other people's art? And why is that? Because I like looking at it, thinking about it, thinking about somebody else's thoughts. You know, I think that's what's fantastic about art, that we do have this exchange and that I think co-op communities in particular are very good for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got another question here. Um, specifically talking, I think, about the inspiration with Native American art and masks that you've mentioned. She says, you look to other cultures for inspiration. How do you respond to current arguments against cultural appropriation? Where do you situate that mm -hmm. inspiration versus appropriation? You know, uh, uh, there was a period of maybe 20 years ago when there was continuously um, uh, uh, published essays in, in, in art magazines, so on about appropriation. You know, I can't imagine myself being first human on this earth with a stick in my hand drawing the line in the sand. I have history. That history was done, in fact, by people who are connected to us genetically. You know, I know that my family uh, has in the past scraped knuckles on making stone sculptures or uh, tile roofs or something, you know. So the entire environment, I mean, we inherit cities, we inherit streets, we inherit books, we inherit ideas. And so I inherit them. And I don't feel that I am uh, uh, abusing anybody or, or uh, t taking their beauty without making it functional today, you know, which is another time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a transformative process. And um, I do know that there are people who don't agree with this, but this is my view. 
that mm. it is all inherited. I mean, I don't imagine that Leonardo da Vinci for one second made work just for himself or that he didn't begin with, we know that he used the Roman architecture um, as inspiration. We actually know that it's the same of Michelangelo, same of Caravaggio mm -hmm. and so on, because uh, we are given these gifts from previous generations. And, uh, and uh, uh, if something has a true impact on you, then it's true. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got questions here. A couple questions came up about the self-portraits in particular, and we haven't talked about them very much. No. Would you talk about, could you just talk about those and, and what is it about the self-portraits? And that's sort of connected here to a related question, um, which talks about being a participant and an observer in your art. And is there uh, an artwork or a series of works that feel the most vulnerable to you? And I, I ask that in conjunction with the self-portrait because I'm wondering how vulnerable those self-portraits make you feel. Mm -hmm. You know, I became interested in portraiture at the time when there was really no interest in portraiture. In fact, it was considered to be the art that was in a crisis. And so in a way that kind of liberated me. And I thought what I should do is uh, make self portraits rather than some friends offered me their faces to use to express the whole range of emotions. And I thought, no, I am not going to do this to Molly and you know, whoever. Uh, I am going to do this to me because I will excuse myself and say, okay, I am using my face, but I'm talking about you and you and you. And so I am thinking of a particularly uh, good example of that would be uh, aging process. Mm -hmm. and there was a moment in my life when I saw that it was an irreversible decline of in my in my looks and I don't think that that's different for men men also go through that but the difference was and is that women uh, once their bodies start changing are diminished in their importance that their beauty is reduced and you become more or less irrelevant or something like that and we know that this is a uh, uh, cu culturally true of everywhere. Uh, fashion models tell us that we should be beautiful and always young and always incredibly dressed and so on. And I decided I would make these portraits. That one, was, one is called um, uh, Butterflies in My Stomach when I saw that. I, I love this one. Yes. yes and we then really another like one is a lipstick, you know, trying yes. to fix yourself. And another one is what would my face look if I did uh, surgery, which I of course never did. As a feminist, I wouldn't. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of things, I decided I would only use me and talk about maybe bigger cultural umbrella than, than just me and my studio by all means. So, you know, um, so some of these paintings are very, sad and one is even called crying time and I'm thinking always of Picasso's crying woman uh, as, as an incredible example of describing how we all sometimes feel like that but then also a triumphant one when I was 60 and everybody was celebrating me and giving me balloons and giving me presents and I'm thinking all of that matters. You know, these are human feelings. And I admired very much many artists who, uh, women artists that had courage to do that kind of thing and, and, and so fearless again. Well, there's a question <laughs> while we're on that topic, there's a question in here specifically asking for the name of an artist or artists who've inspired you. Are there any of those women artists who you've worked with or who came before you, who've in particular influenced? Yes, Kate Colwitz is one, you know? And, and then I, I, I wrote down, uh, I really love Marlene Dumas, mm -hmm. who is now. 
Then, of course, John Mitchell, you know, fantastic. Then Philida Barlow, it's a contemporary. Actually, I think she's descendant of Darwin. It's very funny, but I mean, <laughs> complete coincidence. Philida Barlow is a wonderful one. Louise Bourgeois, you know, they all had courage to do self-portraits. Mm -hmm. And I like that. It's a really, those self-portraits, especially taken in the aggregate, are such a revealing look at not just your life and your vulnerability, but as you say, there is something really moving about the feminine as we age, right? Mm -hmm. And and our sense of selves as, yeah. as mothers, but also beyond, right? And when we're, yeah. we're losing that part, it's there's something really soft about yeah. the self-portraits. There is, uh, I, I mean, I find them, I, I find them, you know, because of their color and being cut out, quite unique and, and, and strong works. But uh, more importantly, all these years went by and I still identify with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I know what they are about. They seem clear to me. lyndall has got another good question here. She says, you talk a lot about language, but you don't use text very much in your work. Is that a disconnect or not? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, no, I think that language exists in several different ways. One is verbal and another one is written. I am very able and, and happy to do the verbal part. So I don't feel disconnect. In my work, I don't necessarily have a lot of it, but I have some, you know, and I, I, I Maybe there is a disconnect, but I don't see it. In fact, these palimpsest pages are about sentences, the ones that I'm doing now, and erasing them and, and making sentences again and so on. So it's, um, it's a, a particularly interesting topic in my mind, words and language, you know, but it does seem to be mostly verbal for me. She's right. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a couple of questions here right at the end. We've got, we're nearly out of time, but I'm going to send you the transcript of the Q&A because we got a number of just really wonderful. When you're having a low day, you should read some of the oh, comments right. that came in. No. People effusing about how wonderful you are and, and oh. what a joy it is to see you and hear about your work. So we'll share that with you. Oh, thank um, you. I a lot of friends, that. I think, who are in the crowd who, who are sending you their love. Um, here, we've got a couple more questions. In addition to the Palimpsest project, what else are you working on right now? I'm working also on another project, which is Assamic letters. Assamic language is the language that does, it's absurd. It doesn't have a meaning. So it's only comprised of marks. And I decided on my walks this summer that I liked so much the marks that were made by nature, their cracks in the street. But then somebody came, uh, you know, somebody professional came with, with uh, uh, a tar and followed the cracks. These are messages for them to be repaired. These are very fascinating and interesting marks. I am going to, I may have many, I'm going to edit them and, and see if I can use them against the white background as, as uh, very dynamic, wonderful images. So there'll be paintings or sculptures? Uh, they, they are going to be uh, another book. Another book. Oh, I completely missed the yeah. book. Part. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mention that. No, yeah. that sounds really good. Yes. Well. I think we have we have some very nice comments from Landall and from uh, several of the attendees. So we'll share those with you. Um, okay, thank you. And yes. before we turn everyone loose, so a couple things, a couple housekeeping things. First, thank you everybody for coming. It's always, I'm telling you, I've had the privilege of a couple of studio visits with Vesna. And I love these conversations, Vesna. Thank it's you. such a joy to hear about your work. And thank, thank you to all I of you. I hope you're not us. disappointed. 
No, <laughs> I'm so grateful for all of you out there who are sharing part of your evening with us. It's really, it's really wonderful. And, and we really do appreciate Thank you all. Yeah. You're going to be getting a survey. Those of you who came, you're going to be getting an email survey because your responses will help us tweak our digital programs so that they better meet the interests and needs of all of you that we're trying to provide programs with and for. So please respond. If you do, we've got a bribe in there. There's a $20 gift certificate for some lucky survey respondent for the WAM shop. So you can spend it on some special some things at the WAM shop. And while I'm talking about the WAM shop, uh, we've got a sale, the holiday sales going on this weekend. So if you're in the mood to get a book, this book, the new, uh, we've got several Wiseman published books in there if you're interested in art book. This is a really good gift giving season for art books. So 20% off this weekend for WAM members and for University of Minnesota faculty, students, and staff. So if you're thinking about getting an art book, now's a good time to either call the shop or pop in Thursday through Sunday and get one. If you'd like to support WAM's digital programs like this, we would also really love it if you would give a donation at some point when you can. There are lots of worthy causes right now, but we sure can use your support to continue to provide free programs like this. So in that email that you get from us with the survey link, you will find links about free membership. You will find a link to the survey and you'll also find a donation link if you feel so inclined to kick in a couple dollars to help keep these programs strong. And that's it. That's it. Thank, Thank you, you for so coming. much. Wonderful. This is a delight. I look forward to seeing you again. And thanks again, everyone, for coming Thank tonight. You all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night.